Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jordan Huggins. Thank you for joining us today. We're not going to get started just yet. We're going to get started probably a couple of minutes after 10. Um, I know people who are still rolling out of bed or they're coming from something else, but I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us <clears throat> for our brand new digital event series. This is the first talk in that series. Uh, today, it, new realities and a global perspective hope from the east and today we will be having our very own ceo janice wang and our executive director of consulting don howard presenting um again <clears throat> we're not going to get started just yet so if you guys could just hang on um and we'll get started soon enough just a couple quick housekeeping notes that i'll i'll repeat a couple times um we this this will only run about 20 minutes or so and then we'll leave plenty of time for a Q&A at, at the end. If you have any questions, please submit those questions to us. We're, we're gonna have the Q&A at the end again. And you can submit those questions in your GoToWebinar portal. There is a drop-down list that says questions. Um, and you can just send it privately or you can send it all. And then we will do our best to ask all of those questions. If you have any issues or technical issues during the webinar during this talk just chat me directly and again that should be a drop down menu at the very bottom of your go to webinar portal and then there's a chat feature and you can send that directly to me um, and i can do my best to help you during it so thank you guys again for uh, attending today and we're going to get started very shortly Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody around the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jordan Huggins. I am the marketing manager here at Alvin On. We're not gonna get started just yet. I wanna give another minute or two for people to join us um, as they get out of bed, as they finish up other meetings and, and stuff. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our first talk in our new realities uh, digital event series. Today, we're gonna be discussing a global perspective, hope from the East, and our talk today is being led by our very own CEO, Janice Wang, and our executive director of consulting, Don Howard. Um, again, we're going to get started in just a minute or two, just to allow people to join us. While we wait, though, just a couple housekeeping notes. We are going to allow for a Q&A at the end of this. It's The whole talk should run roughly 15 to 20 minutes once... <clears throat> Once that is over, we will uh, host a Q&A. Please submit your questions to us, and you can do that in the questions drop-down menu in your GoToWebinar portal. Um, you can send that to me, you can send that to all, um, and then we'll do our best to ask all the questions that are submitted. If you have any technical issues, you can message me directly via the chat box in the same drop-down menu uh, in your portal there. So stick with us. We're going to get started in just a minute or so. Thank you.
Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jordan Huggins, and I'm the marketing manager here at Alvanon. I just want to go ahead and thank you guys so much for joining us for the first talk in our brand new digital event series we're calling New Realities. Today we will be discussing, and today's title is A Global Perspective, Hope from the East. First of all, I hope that everybody is okay. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying sane, most importantly. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Today's talk is only going to run about 20 minutes. Uh, we will leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the talk. Uh, if you would like to submit a question, and I highly encourage you to do so, um, you can do that in your GoToWebinar portal. There is a drop down menu that just simply says questions and you can send that privately or you can send that directly to me um, and uh, we will do our best to ask those questions at the end. If you have any technical issues, please message me directly via the chat box, which is another drop down menu in your GoToWebinar portal. Um, if you have any issues, you can raise your hand and I will reach out to you privately. Now, I think without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it off to our speakers today. We're very privileged to have our very own CEO, Janice Wang, and our executive director of consulting, Don Howard. Janice and Don, why don't you guys go ahead and take it away? Good morning to all of you in the US. Uh, good afternoon to all of those joining from Europe and the Middle East. And good evening to all of my fellow Asians. Um, Don and I are so happy that you've taken some time out of your online day. We thought it was really important to be able to communicate what we are seeing from different perspectives, culturally, strategically, and from a business and personal perspective. For me, um, it's been really important to stay connected with the operational side and to share some of the things that we've seen and heard not only from our clients, but from our friends from around the region. Don, I, I know you and your team have been in daily contact with many brands. Hi, Don. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, Janice. Uh, actually, uh, it's been really important for us to be in contact with our community in the product development and technical design areas during these difficult times to, to really to listen and understand the challenges, uh, offer some advice if we can. And that's something that will be going ongoing for us. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to start with is starting with some hope. <laughs> um, Today, there are no new locally transmitted cases in China. There are some imported cases of Chinese overseas citizens returning to China and Hong Kong, but any persons who are entering are screened, tracked, and then also as a community, we work as a civil unit to make sure that everyone is staying within the rules. Um, but for the past few weeks now, we've seen movement in most of the cities. Um, and the downside has actually been that since people are using their cars instead of public transport, all of that wonderful blue sky non-pollution is um, kind of rolling back and traffic has been quite heavy. Um, so I wanted to share with you some optimism that we're seeing from Chinese consumers. Um, my cousin in Beijing has a chain of cafe kind of restaurants uh, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Chengdu. And actually, they kept three of their outlets open throughout this time, and even though they had restrictions. They have about you know 10 people in at one time, and um, even though they can probably seat about 100 and something. Um, all of his outlets have been fully operational now for three weeks. And anecdotally, his point to me is that people really do want some interaction. And so even though they're still restricting people in and out, the restaurants are, you know, the revenues are, they're getting back to where they were. I mean, it's not great, but it's, you know, it's starting to recover. Um, from Jola, who's our marketing manager in Shanghai, who has gone back to Nanjing, who had gone back to Nanjing to visit with her family during Chinese New Year, she actually stayed home for nearly four weeks in isolation. Now, um, she told me that Nanjing was much more stringent than in Shanghai in terms of how they manage social distancing. You know, they were given one card per family. It's a little piece of paper that said that they can go out to purchase essential goods. And when I asked how 
she, you know, as a young person felt about this. She said, there's a sense of control and comfort that comes when everybody's in the same boat. Um, there's a force plan that helped her to kind of process the situation that they were all in. Um, Joel has gone back to Shanghai earlier this month, and but before going back, she checked with her residential ward whether she was had to self-quarantine. Um, and that, once she realized that that had already lifted um, in Shanghai, um, she took the train back um, to Shanghai, you know, even though she was said she was completely suited up. And when I was speaking to her actually earlier um, today, she was actually traveling by metro, um, the subway, back to her home. And the subway was full of people. And, you know, she like everyone else, has a protocol of how she greets people, how she, what she touches, how she disinfects herself when she gets home. Um, and even though they've kind of restricted less people of who she's actually seeing, she actually met with a brand at our fit studio in Shanghai last Friday um, because they needed to approve production and they couldn't get hold of a mannequin. So it's been quite interesting in that in that regard. So of course, uh, demand for apparel is actually down in China, um, but we are actually seeing kind of signals of recovery. Of course, retail traffic is pretty non-existent still. Uh, we're seeing in Joy City in Beijing, um, is, which is one of the biggest kind of malls. It's it's a little bit of a ghost town, um, but online sales, uh, which is funnily enough, directly corre correlated to whether you can get delivery of things is back up. Now, Shenfeng is one of the, the biggest kind of delivery units in China, and they're back to next day delivery schedules. So for all of you who have Amazon Prime, and I want you to have hope because this too shall pass, uh, you in the US, and you will get all of your weird and wonderful non-essential items delivered again. <laughs> um, Hema, which is the supermarket chain from Alibaba, is back to same day deliveries. Um, so this, these are all very, very good signs. We're seeing Anta, the sportswear giant. They actually have kicked off um, some of their kind of regular kind of marketing promotions back on, on WeChat. Um, and they, on March the 8th, on Women's Day, they did um, a promo with um, the Lipstick King. And if any of you haven't heard of him, the Lipstick King, uh, Li Jia Ti, um, you can watch him on, on TikTok. It's super, super fun. Anyway, he was promoting shoes yeah. and um, they literally sold out in seconds. Um, more importantly, though, um, I think people are at home and they need an outlet for their kind of, you know, just something a little bit less stressful. And leisure wear is very important at this point. So people are buying leisure wear because comfort is key when you're at home. Pajamas have been the best performing category next to fitness wear. And, you know, Vogue and, and Cosmo China, they've been putting out pictures out there of that's, it. That's great. That's great. Although we want to caution, you know, ne not necessarily want to be wearing your pajamas during a video conference, but we certainly see some examples where people are doing that. Uh, that's really great perspective, Janice. Um, and I know a lot of us are also very concerned and wondering about what you're seeing uh, in the actual supply chain. Hmm. So in the past couple of weeks, um, I've been talking with many supply side executives as well as kind of the brand sourcing um, executives. And when the virus was in China, it was mostly a supply chain issue, you know, where people were trying to prioritize kind of delivery dates and brands who had really good relationships with vendors, both financially and, you know, interpersonally, they obviously managed their delivery dates much better. And I had one brand tell me that they only had a 2% slippage rate, which I, I was just astonished. Um, you know, notably, you know, their cut and sew is mostly in Southeast Asia, but, you know, their fabric all comes from China. And those were kind of not some of the, the stories that we were hearing. Um, and I think the reason why they were able to do that was because they had a plan and they also had a lot of trust on both sides of the equation. Um, that was about a month ago. Subsequently, of course, it's become significantly more difficult because we've seen that 
demand has fallen so much. Um, and so now what we're seeing is that brands are kind of trying to slow down the supply side so they can, you know, sh stop the shipments happening and kind of move uncut material to, to next season. Um, but not all are that lucky. When we we're hearing of vendors being told that they're not going to be paid for goods already made, um, we do hear about things like financing requests. Um, it's not, I mean, we've all been here before, uh, but I think some of the stuff is that changes in demand are very granular de decisions that, that require some supreme agility. And these companies who can move quickly to prioritize kind of on the ground snap decisions that also have a transparent relationship with their vendor partners, they have a really, they have a better chance of thriving. You know, Janice, that's fascinating. And you know, it ties in very closely to what we you've mentioned here uh, on the plans and agility on the ground. It's very similar to uh, what we are experiencing here. And you know, you mentioned a key word and that is, you know, the importance of a plan. Um, and we know that, you know, whether you're a large organization, a mid-sized company, or even at the individual level, having a plan really provides some solace in times of stress and uncertainty because there's structure to it. Um, a plan gives you something positive uh, and productive to focus on. And, you know, for most companies in normal times, they already have three to five year strategic plans that exist, which is a good place to start. Uh, many of our customers are going forward with their strategic plans. In some cases, we're seeing large strategic initiatives that are actually being accelerated because the objectives of that plan are more important now than they were three months ago. So, and the other thing we're seeing is you just everything is so disrupted now. We have such a wide range of fundamental preparedness. Um, you know, this kind of those among us in this industry or in any industry for that matter, who had already been telecommuting. Uh, and because of that, there was essentially a zero ramp up time for them to continue working. But we're hearing from uh, our brands, especially our friends in product development and technical design, where they really have never telecommunicated at all. And they're just needing a le uh, uh, at least a week or so just to figure out the logistics of it. So uh, assuming that there is a plan in place, how does the work get done? Um, what we're seeing really is process and tools are probably the biggest challenges. Uh, if you've been in 3D, you might be a little ahead of the curve, but you know we're hearing from clients who don't really have even standard fit tools in place at the vendor base or even in the office to bring home, even if they could. You know, I, I think sometimes um, when I speak to executive teams, um, the granularity of uh, you know every, people's everyday tasks are, are not that apparent. You know, we kind of assume that every member of a technical team has the tools that they need and kind of we assume that our vendors have the exact tools as well. And, and we also assume that our processes are easily portable. I, I don't know that that's the case. No, I, I don't think so. And a perfect illustration of that, of course, is the heartbeat of any apparel organization and is that garment fittings and getting to approval that need to occur. Um, you know, we've been talking to a lot of the brands that, that we work with and as for garment fittings themselves, you know, not everybody's completely closed. There are some that are venturing into the office, maybe solo and might conduct a fitting, uh, with a video conference for the rest of the teams. Uh, one amusing kind of antidote on that, as I heard that one of the benefits was that there were much fewer people in the fitting room. That's something we can learn from, isn't it? Uh, and you know, speaking of video conferencing, uh, assuming that your vendor partners are still operating, you know that use of video conferencing that we've done a lot of in the past um, is something that you can really rely on now to get to the next iteration without you know necessarily uh, missing a beat. Um, and 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 if someone send a physical sample already, 
your vendor might have their original keep sample that you can use. So you might be able to go ahead and, and keep that ball rolling uh, without having receiving a physical uh, sample. So, you know, I've always told my team and, and I know that this is something that's really important when in times of stress, you know, you tend to focus on what you can't do. Uh, don't do that. Don't focus on what you can't do. You really need to focus on what you can do. Um, you know, and, and, and in all of this, uh, what have you got to lose if you do something differently? And more importantly, what do you have to learn? So whether you have a working plan that exists right now, or you're creating a short-term plan to get through this difficult time, go ahead and work the plan, okay? And as Janice was alluding to earlier, uh, you know, you got to give your teams, you know, at a granular level, the ability to be flexible and give them the agility to make decisions uh, within the framework of that plan. And, you know, there's going to be some part of it that's going to be improvise and a part that's also going to be some compromise uh, in order to move that forward, um, which reminds me of a quote that I've always loved on this subject uh, from Leonard Bernstein, who is, uh, for those of you who don't know, famous composer, uh, famous conductor, actually wrote West Side Story. Uh, There's a really, I think, brilliant, tight uh, a quote here on what we're talking about. If you're going to set out to achieve great things, two things are needed a plan and not quite enough time so you know for now for most life is very stressful we have to continue to engender uh trust uh with your teams you trust people that they're going to be responsible and they can work uh with autonomy and go ahead and work that plan you know i i think everybody can lead when they when they know exactly what they have to do. That seems so simple, but it's really important. So, you know, one thing's for sure that this is gonna pass. Um, when we come out on the other side, many things will look completely different than they do now. Uh, be on the lookout, I would say, as you're doing your day-to-day -day tasks for things that you have been doing in the past, because it's the way you've always done things, and challenge yourself how things will need to be done differently in the future. This will include, you know, how you collaborate with your teams, steps in the process that may or may not be necessary or critical, and, you know, what tools are you missing or that you should have in place to do your job more efficiently and effectively going forward. And there's no question about it, but the way we have been working is changing right before our very eyes. You know, um, my, my dad, um, he, the founder of Alvanon, you know, he said to me, you know, or, or he also used to say, all we can do is evolve. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about that. And we used to have centuries to evolve. Um, and if we take that Lenin Bernstein at his word, and we say that we have no time, what can we actually do? Um, this image that I want to show you is, um, one of a snorkel mask. Um, this is something that was made out of need, right? Uh, these 3D en engineers in Italy, they they, they kind of, they, actually they were just, these Italian engineers, they 3D printed the valve piece so that they could make a ventilator out of a snorkel mask. It, it's pretty MacGyver and, 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 and genius <laughs> and, and just super useful, you know? Um, you know, it's, they took, they took an, an existing need and, and they immediately changed it because they saw there was there was something that they could do. And when we talk a little bit about granularity, you know, my dad always used to say that it's only people who are doing the work who can best tell you what their needs actually are. And I saw this this morning of nurses running out of protective equipment and they were changing their processes so that they could preserve all of the masks that they had left and all the, the, the protective gear that they had left, you know. They, um, instead of um, running 
tubes to the IV pump, uh, in, instead of going in to change all the IV pumps of the patients um, so that they didn't have to suit up every time, they had to suit up every time they did that, um, they actually ran tubes to the IV pumps and left the pumps outside in the hallway so that they didn't have to change every single time they went in to see the patient and they needed to change the, the IV pump. Um, you know, it's on that note that we don't really exist as an industry to kind of create pretty frocks. I think clothing has always been a need and, and the world, what the world needs right now to wear are masks. So kind of in that spirit, we've seen lots of people everywhere start home manufacturing. <laughs> um, I'm very grateful to like Design Lab uh, Miami. Uh, they created this pattern. Uh, thank you, I saw it on Instagram. And um, my daughter and her friends cut out the patterns. Um, you know, the youngest one here is six. Um, and they, they kind of started wanting to make these things. And here's the master our very own Alice Rodriguez, making her kind of stash of masks for her community, um, basically to keep some of her vulnerable neighbors safe. And I think what I've learned in all of this is that this virus has really taught us all that we can choose, and we can choose to be part of this really helpful community that bonds all together. Um, so we said that we were gonna start with hope, and I think, uh, I hope that we can, kind of end this little talk with some hope. So thank you everyone. Um, if you have any other questions, please let us know. Hey, Don and Janice, thank you guys so much for that. Um, we do have quite a few questions coming in and I'll go ahead and roll right into them. Uh, the first one comes from Gina. Do you think the demand for casual slash athletic wear will continue or will it trend to the other extreme and become more elaborate once public health is secure? You want that one, Janice? Sure. Um, you know, what I think is people like being comfortable. I've actually personally lived out of the my suitcase for the past two months and uh, it's been very sustainable. Um, but I do also think that um, that actually there always goes, pendulums always swing to extremes. When this is all over, I think we're, what we're going to see is this, this sustainable wave is still going to go through. Um, I think we are going to want things that are very fancy, but they're going to be made from things that already exist. And that's just a personal point of view, by the way. <laughs> so... <laughs> Great. Um, this next question comes from Kathy. Um, what about disruption across the rest of Asia? Any signs of hope in other Asian countries that have been resilient or where production is not as affected? Um, I think we're going to see a lot of disruption. And I think, you know, as an industry, uh, we look, we we need to talk about living wages. Um, when factories are good and vendors are, you know, vendors usually try as much as possible to keep this industry running. But I think what we're going to see is that if we keep pushing for a cheaper and cheaper needle and we keep pushing for cheaper and cheaper goods, um, it's inevitable that, you know, you're going to have some bad practices happening. Um, in times of uncertainty, I think that we're seeing, you know, in in certain countries that the raw materials couldn't get to the factories in time. And so therefore there's no piecework to be had. Um, this requires a fundamental shift in the kind of way that we talk about production, right? Uh, we've always gone for very, very long lines, which allow us to have the economies of scale. And I think all big companies are actually thinking about, do we need, do we need to change the way that we make things? And how much do we make? That's such an important component of this. Great, thank you guys. Uh, sorry, you were gonna say something, Janice? No, just to Don's point, how much do we make? I mean, I think that really calls for better planning and, and um, you know, not just thinking about all of the designs that we do that we, we just have so much inventory. I think because this next wave 
we will actually change some of the ways that we plan our um, how we do production and how we what we put out to the market. There's a lot of efficiencies to be had. Exactly. Um, great, thank you guys. Uh, this is a, a a separate question from Carolina, but I think it's somewhat related to the original question. Do you have any insights on India? They just went in lockdown for three weeks, and what could India learn from what China went through? A very good friend of mine is currently living in India, in Mumbai, and I think the thing that is a little bit different is that culturally, um, I don't know that, I, I think it's not, again, it's not, an, it, nobody wants to go into lockdown, nobody. You know, it affects a lot in a, a, of people and the, the movement and just things that people can do to survive. So if India is able to get its people, um, their people to basically go into lockdown, hopefully there will be some social distancing that will allow the virus not to spread so fast. Um, we have to just wait and see. I think every culture is different. But if we can track people, the biggest thing to actually go through lockdown is and be able to is to be able to have a plan to screen track and actually test people i think south korea did it really really well china's done it very well as well and the world is watching the world is watching how people do and you know the good news is people are learning as we go uh, as a data geek um, i love the fact that there's so much data collection going on and the more data that you have and the more capable people you have to analyze that data uh, the better decisions are going to be made. And, and those decisions are going to start to get, as we were saying earlier, back to a very granular level. Great. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, another question. This comes in from ISIS. Uh, what advice, I, I think a, a very unfortunate um, uh, thing that's come up out of, out of the COVID and everything is that the, uh, the loss of employment. And so ISIS um, is asking, what advice can you give to technical designers who have lost their jobs because of the situation? You know, we, we've been hearing about this a lot, not only from this, you know, terrible pandemic, but also recent uh, years when there's been a shift to, you know, 3D and people getting very fearful of their jobs. And I guess what I would say uh, would be super important is that, uh, you know, this certain uh, emergency aside, you really have to do everything you can to understand what you can contribute to an organization with your skill sets. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people are changing the way they do things every day. Uh, and, and, you know, I think back, uh, you know, kind of an anecdote. Uh, many years ago when I worked at an organization who uh, decided that they were going to all go on to, uh, you know, Gerber silhouettes for digital pattern making. Uh, and in a room of 45 pattern makers, um, roughly a third jumped right at the chance, roughly a third flat out refused, and about a third were in the middle trying to decide which way they were, which way they were going to go. Uh, so, you know, th these kind of things happen in any industry over time. So all I can say to you is get your skill sets up, understand what new skills are needed. There's all kinds of avenues for online learning and skills builder. Talk to your community, uh, your, your other uh, technical people and see how they're doing things different. Stay relevant, stay hopeful, and let's hope this thing doesn't last too long. Um, just for also as an aside, I would also say that, you know, the biggest skills that we actually are looking for and I see huge demand for is going digital. Um, and uh, technical design going digital means, you know, picking up kind of uh, 3D skill sets. Um, uh, Alvanon has a couple of courses that we put online, um, you know, and we're going to put on many more on uh, and this would be available on motif.org. So if you, you know, our courses, at this point in time, I think it's a very, it's a very good time to actually continue to think about the digital aspect of all of this, because those skill sets we completely will need going forward. And if yeah. you are a technical, you already have the base for all of those, uh, for, for that going forward. 
And the other thing I will add to that is the large organizations that are transforming the way they do things, they value people. OK, so you're still going to need people. You're still going to need the expertise. You're still going to need the brains to make decisions. There's no way that the industry is going to be overrun uh, by autonomous uh, uh, activities. So just stay hopeful, uh, get your skills up, um, keep your eye open. And we can only hope in that this doesn't last uh, too long. Yeah, very good. Thank you guys both so much. And then if you are struggling with job loss or anything, we are best of luck to you. Um, there, we have a bunch of questions coming in. You guys are uh, you guys are hot. You guys are on fire. Uh, this next question is from Brianne. What tools and processes have you heard that product developers and technical designers are implementing when working remote? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. So, uh, you know, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be in 3D, which I know everyone isn't, but this is another reason to look into it. Uh, if they're able to go in and use their 3D assets, uh, you know, and actually up to and including uh, garment approval, not only that, but really in the, we see a lot of, of how 3D helps people just make decisions quicker. So, you know, back to Janice's point about the, uh, you know, how we're going to do things differently, but, you know, using 3D collaboratively with the cross-functional team to get good decisions made. Um, not everyone's going to have a physical fit mannequin in their house. And of course, that's something that, that we feel is a very important tool for garment evaluation. So, you know, if your vendor has one and you can communicate with them, uh, via video conference to do some corrections or do some evaluation. Um, that's another way to do it. Um, like I said, not everyone is closed. So even the people who aren't closed, they're finding that there are not enough tools actually in their uh, physical space at work for people to work independently uh, and get their jobs done. So um, uh, another thing we're hearing is uh, back to that do what you can do, not what you can't do. Um, you know, if you happen to be in a season where you're developing tech packs or, you know, you're creating new uh, 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 projects, uh, new, new seasons and collections, you know, find ways to be collaborative with your cross-functional teams and, you know, uh, you know, evaluate what steps you're using and some of the things you might have been doing before, which are truly unnecessary and really kind of waste time, you might have to get a little bit more hasty. Uh, and make better decisions about what's truly necessary to get the work done. Hope that answers. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Don. Um, we have uh, several more questions. Let's just keep going. Um, Shahida wants to know what do we do when our current target audience are. Uh, mid-income people and they are currently struggling with finances because of COVID and definitely not buying. And then her question is, do we change our target audience in terms of communications? Uh, I think it would be a dangerous thing to change your target audience in the middle of what you do. I mean, that would be a, that would be almost a, a panic. I think what we're seeing, and I don't know if you have omni-channel opportunities, but, you know, people are still buying things. Uh, Amazon is alive and well. We see anybody who deals in e-commerce, uh, business is kind of going well, not necessarily in the apparel sector, but um, I think it's about how do you message the same people in a different way um, because they already know what you offer and chances are they still need it. They might not need it right now, but you know we're all hopeful that you know uh, as this passes, uh, there might be a little bit of a pent up demand where people, um, are actually going to go back out and buy. So I would definitely discourage you from changing course just because of this moment in time. Now, if you think that you need to reevaluate uh, before this uh, pandemic occurred, that's a different question. But uh, just to do it because of the current times, I think that would be a mistake. I hope that answers okay. that question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Don. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, do you believe this is going to accelerate the shift to domestic apparel production to better mitigate supply risks? Um, look, I think that we've been wanting to shift some sort of apparel to domestic supply, but the fact of the matter is that we actually lost a lot of, I mean, in all of the Western countries, and, and 
and with maybe the exception of kind of northern Spain, Portugal, it, you know, we lost a lot of the ability to actually manufacture. We don't have enough sewers, don't have enough pattern makers. Um, and these skills, you know, if you have to reskill that in order for it to come back to local to local manufacturing. Um, I think there's also a, a matter of actually whether we change to smaller runs. If there, if we can, if we can gear up domestic or nearshore uh, production to allow for, you know, more agile um, uh, supply chain with um, a little bit more kind of uh, shorter runs, then yes, um, things actually do need to come back. Uh, but I think that the whole methodology has to change, right? Uh, from the whole point of designing something all the way down to producing it. Um, and it's it's different for for big brands. That's There's no way that, that domestic supply is going to have the capacity to do that. Exactly. I think, you know, it's all about the scale at the end of the day. But having said that, you know, just using the example of people that are uh, scrambling to put, uh, you know, get as many PPEs and masks out as possible. You know, it, it's it's very interesting to see the mobilization of the small companies, the mid-sized companies that for a certain and very targeted reason are ramping up. Now, yes, I think that would also indicate that there's more opportunity for near shoring and domestic but I don't think we could ever expect that the whole supply chain gets shifted back to one country or another. And that's all about, you know, some of the economies of scale. Great. Um, thank you guys so much. I think uh, our, our goal this whole time was to kind of wrap up early um, to not take up too much of everybody's time. So I just have um, two or so more questions. Isabel, hi all, really great topic and very timely too. Thank you very much, Isabel. I agree that the fashion industry landscape as we know it is drastically going to change following this global event. I feel businesses will be looking to, to diversify their global orders to mitigate risk and reduce over dependencies with far shore production routes. What do you think will be the most significant change that you can predict? <laughs> well, I think in times of crisis, uh, back to uh, talking about uh, how you do things. So, you know, the key, the key um, challenges we're seeing right now when doing your job is process and tools. So, um, you know, on one hand, there might be people who just default and go back and do it the same way they always did. Um, but on the other hand, there might be people who are adept enough and uh, you know, looking at this and saying, "Wow, we actually can do things differently, a little bit more." agile um, a little bit more efficiently and it's not at the expense of people it's at the um, the gaining of the time and the speed to market so um, hopefully the lessons that come out of this will be used in a very positive way um, having said that uh, our industry is notorious for being loath to change so actually you know it's hard to predict but the more progressive brands are going to use this as an opportunity to get even better at what they do. Great, thank you, Don. Um, Mario has submitted a question. How do you see sustainability efforts in the apparel industry being impacted by the current crisis? Ooh, Janice, you want to go first? <laughs> <sighs> you know, my, you, my, you know, for me, sustainability has always been about efficiency. We actually lose so much in the process and the design process of actually what we do. And that's actually part of the reason that we as an industry cannot be that sustainable. So, you know, it's such a wide topic. Um, I think actually, funnily enough, though, that this crisis brings us to a point where we actually say we must change. We have no choice but to change. And hopefully that will allow for, I don't think it's it right now we're working so much on the innovation of things and sustainability, but we're look at working really much more on the, I think we're work, really working on a whole new way of doing things as opposed to like new materials and things like that. Of course, those things will be there, but um, I think the more important thing is that we can scale 
some of these uh, these these things that are already out there and actually make better decisions in that process so that the yeah. state so that go ahead don yeah and uh you know going back to our topic about plans so many brands in the world have sustainability initiatives as part of their ongoing plans so like we were saying earlier take a look good hard look at that plan today yeah, and as you continue to work that plan, what kind of adjustments are you going to see right before your very eyes that you need that you can actually act on even quicker than you thought you could? So, you know, there's not a, a company on the earth that doesn't think about sustainability, especially in apparel. But this is an opportunity, as I said, is to work that plan and be a little bit more agile and nimble and see how far you can stretch that. Great. Um, thank you both. Okay, so I'm gonna do. I'm gonna uh, submit two more questions for you guys. Um, Mudasar has asked, which we I think we've heard this question kind of ad infinitum from a lot of people. The push for 3D, everybody wants to know. And Mudasar has asked, which 3D software is best to learn now as a digital transformation uh, to fulfill future needs? Well, the 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 great thing about 3D is you've got a lot of options. And we're not in the business of saying which one is the best. They all have their pros and cons. Um, they all have uh, uh, different applications and different, you know, everybody has a different business model. They have different uh, 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 processes. So, you know, I, I don't even want to mention any names, but please just get into the details of what each uh, 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 software has to offer the pros and cons and also know that there are many organizations who use more than one software for different purposes within the organization. I think what's much more important is to actually get into something, learn it, learn how it works. It's, it's not pixie dust. We always tell our clients, you know, you, you, it's another skill that you have to learn. It's a different tool, a different way of doing what you already know how to do. Uh, and it requires some time to figure out. So uh, and it, less about which one is the best and more about start working in something and learning how it works. Um, I'd actually also like to add to that. It's really about fundamentals of uh, the job, right? Um, I think understanding that 3D is not a catch-all for everything, that it's about um, working digitally. So, you know, for all for all anybody cares, you could draw a picture uh, with a pen on on an iPad, you know, and that might actually suffice for certain things like making digital comments. Uh, 3D itself for each software, right? Every which one has has a different use, as Don has said. But I think going back to the fundamentals of where you most enjoy of a job, right? Yeah. What yeah. makes you interested and what allows you to go down that rabbit hole? Because, you know, for me, um, uh, from for my daughter, for instance, she would really like to go down the rabbit hole of figuring out, you know, how to thread something or do some very, very specific thing in the software. But I don't care as long as I get a result. You know, it, it for different people it means different things. Yep. Okay, Great. Jordan, one more. One more question. Um, real quick, you guys have submitted so many great questions. We unfortunately cannot get to all of them. What I can tell you is that we are going to answer all these questions and we will get answers to those uh, uh, back to you. Whether we answer them now or not, we will be able to get answers to them from Don and Janice and get them back to you guys. So the last question, this is kind of related to everything going on. Um, you know, there's been a real push for work from home and work remote. What we're seeing now is that uh, a lot of companies, a lot of people who previously thought, oh, I, there's no way I can do my job from home, actually turns out that you can do it and you can sometimes even more effectively. So Julian has submitted this question, do you see consumer behavior with technology changing permanently post-virus? And if so, which technologies do you think are best positioned? Wow. So number one, as I said kind of earlier, um, you'd be surprised how many people are working silently right now and being very productive because they've always done it that way. Um, and you can bet that any any business right now that's having a boom, uh, uh, you know, anybody that makes Clorox, for example, or CVS or, you know, any of these these companies that are experiencing a, a surge in demand, 
you can bet that all their workers are contributing on a daily basis and they haven't missed a beat. Um, I also found it interesting uh, when this started occurring about three weeks ago, all the people on television, the newscasters, the weather, they're like, oh, well, we can't work from home. That's impossible. And now what do you see? You turn on the Today Show, you tr everybody's somewhere else working. So I think what it really tend, lends itself to is um, letting people really understand that there are a lot of different ways you can do things. And working from home, uh, which you know for many uh, organizations always seemed like a taboo, um, when we come out on the other side of this, you'll be surprised how much flexibility will will uh, will uh, emanate from this kind of a disaster. I think the other thing is that we're seeing need, right? I think throughout this, I think what we're realizing is that we need to design to a need. You need to answer a need when you're creating something. And so I think consumers will actually gravitate towards looking for things that they actually need more than, and the wants will be, you know, the desirability of it, which is something that apparel always functioned on, um, is going to be less. And it really does point towards also the sustainability aspect of everything. Um, I do also think that in terms of technology, I think that we're going to just see that Technology will leapfrog a lot of the, the, our, our daily things that we normally do and the creativity that comes along with it. I mean, I, who thought that online learning could be as amazing as it is with so many different kinds of outlets of teaching people just because we're not in front of them? So I think we're going to see a lot of tie in between um, learning something, doing something, um, and and buying something right from this more kind of question of, question of do i need this and, and I think, if i do really want it yep and let's not forget people are social creatures so you know it's not going to be like everybody ships online i think that you know one of the most uh, uh compelling examples of that is the kindergarten kids who want to be with their friends Right. So, you know, it, I don't see a, that the, the whole society shifts one way or the other. It'll settle out in different ways. But let's remember that people at the end of the day are social beings and they enjoy being together. Yes. And a screen is no substitute for human <laughs> interaction. It exactly. really isn't. All right. Uh, Janice, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure doing this along with you uh, 12,000 miles away. Uh, uh, Jordan, you would, would you like to wrap this up for us? Yes, Don, Janice, thank you both so much. Uh, and thank all of you for tuning in. This is uh, the first talk in our brand new digital series that we're calling New Realities. Today we uh, discussed uh, global perspective, hope from the East. We will be doing this really every Wednesday for at least the next two to three weeks. Um, we're kind of waiting to see how things um, shake out and how if when this blows over. Um, we hope that you tune in next Wednesday, April 1st, and even April 8th, Wednesday, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, thank you guys so much. Again, we will be distributing a copy of this webinar to everybody that's registered. We will send out the answers to those questions in an FAQ sheet. Uh, thank you guys so much again, and stay safe and stay sane.